hoping he will. <laughs> um, so Becky, uh, before we begin, do you mind just introducing yourself? Tell, tell us who you are and where you're from and uh, what your topic is. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna give my, I'm gonna put a stopwatch on me too because I know that I might just keep going. So <laughs> I'll have to keep an eye on the time. So my name's Becky Grower and I uh, live in Highland, Utah and teach here. Um, I've, I've only been really seriously teaching for about three years, um, but I've made a lot of progress in that time. And I uh, don't have a degree, but I do have my certification and I'm working on my level eight RCM this year um, and hoping to get that done by the end of the year. So I'm I have about, um, 18 students. Um, right now I have six kids and my two, uh, my youngest is 10 and my oldest is 25 and I just had my first grandbaby. So that's kind of exciting. <laughs> so, um, okay, so I am going to um, start, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to go through a little PowerPoint I put together. So sometimes, let's see if we can find it. Oops, not this one. Got to go back. This was working before. Here we go. All right. Okay. So the role of complementary teaching technology and technology in the studio. I use a lot of technology in my studio. And so um, I thought this was kind of the perfect one for me to talk about if I was going to do anything at all. Um, so I'm glad I'm not performing and I'm just talking. So um, sometimes we get a little frustrated when we start thinking about technology and and um, and especially using it in the studio. So I'm hopefully going to give you a few things that'll, there's there's a lot of it. And um, there's, a, there's a little handout that um, has will send to you later that lists all of them so don't feel like you have to copy all of them down they're all, all going to be on the the handout um but you know pick something that you like um, so first off, um, digital piano. So I have two digital pianos in my studio um, so this is um, a Casio um, and it, this is probably my favorite and I put I put a link to it um, to Amazon on my on my uh, uh, handout that I'm giving. So the nice thing about digital pianos is that you can connect them um, to iPads and other things and, and there's lots of games that you can play like um, and, and different things you can do with them with Piano Marvel, Piano Maestro, different note reading apps and um, it'll give instant feedback which is nice. You can also change the voices of um, the pianos as well and, and so help kids to understand you know what a harp, what their piece would sound like as a on a harpsichord or something like that. And you're also able to record performances and play it back for, ki for the kids to listen to, or that you can listen to it. And you can also digitize um, that and it sounds really good uh, for later use, which I've done before. I've, I've recorded uh, accompaniments for people before and it sounds much better than just doing a, you, a, you know, a, a video from your phone or something like that. Okay, so this is my silent piano. This is Yamaha Silent Piano SH2, and I love this. This is great because my husband actually works across the hall from me, and so when I'm practicing, I can just plug in my headphones and I can listen, and it's a really high-quality piano, um, uh, digital piano, but you can also play, you can also play it, and it's a, it's a beautiful brand, and I don't have time to sh give you a demonstration, but on the, the handout, there's a link there as well to... Um, a YouTube that would ki will kind of explain about the silent piano and how it works, but you can you know change the voices on it as well, and and I got it hooked up to a speaker so that I can have my kids listen to it as well. And I do have them record on a fairly regular basis um, and then have them listen to themselves. And then we pick out things that they can work on. So that's definitely how I use the digital piano. Um, and I love the sound of my Yamaha. It's just, it's beautiful. Okay, so here's some of the apps and I'll, I'll try to go through. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna do. Becky, I'm so sorry. I don't think your screen share is showing up. Oh no, okay. Um... Okay, let me go back. We're gonna try it again. Um, okay. okay, maybe if I don't pre if if I don't do the presentation, that might work. Okay, let's try it again. Always worked before. There we go. Is this okay? 
Does this work? Okay. <laughs> I don't I understand. So sometimes, yeah, sometimes if we, if, if I push the play, then it just doesn't, it doesn't work. So we'll just, I will just. But do I don't know why. Here. Okay, so the, here's a few note reading and sight reading uh, resources that I use. So um, a lot of you probably are familiar with Piano Marvel. I do this probably once a month. I have my students take a Sasser test. Um, and I used to have tech time. I'm not doing it right now during COVID um, for most of my students. Basically, they'd come for a half an hour before or, at, or stay after their lesson for half an hour. And this, this is when we do a lot of our our uh, note reading and sight reading and uh, and use a lot of this um, technology that I have and I I would have here I'll show you this picture again um, my little tech time book here um, that had all the different tech time things that hmm. they could do and then they were they'd be able to um, you know uh, mark off what score they got on different things there's my silent piano um, and then, okay, so Piano Maestro is a great one through Joy Tunes, and my younger students especially particularly love Piano Maestro, and so that's what they prefer to do over everything else. The limitation with Piano Maestro is that it, it really doesn't go to a super high level, and so it, it kind of ends through the intermediate. It does have some Sharony books, and it's got all of the Hannon exercises, so I do like using it for that um, because it just gives them a little bit of a backing track to be able to play with. Flash Note Derby is a great one, um, as well as Note Rush for, for testing notes. And um, Tenuto I'll get into a little bit later. That's probably my favorite mm -hmm. one is Tenuto. Uh, Rhythm Lab, Rhythm Cat, Bass Cat. Uh, the most amazing sheet game. They love this. It's great for for rhythms, but it's um, it, it's it's addicting. <laughs> so and so, I have to turn it off on my parental control so they don't sit there and do it the whole time. So I have them doing other things. Um, rhythm swing, sight reading factory. I haven't used a lot, um, but that's another option as well for sight reading. Okay, so. Um, so here's some different resources. I don't know if any of so um, there's a lot of different software for um, uh, reading music. I'm going to change my share so you can see Fourscore. So Fourscore is probably my favorite. Let's see. Okay, and here I've got my hand in here. And the nice thing about this is that you can annotate. So you can, you know, you could write numbers, you know, underneath things or change fingerings or things like that. And then you can just erase it all when you're, when you're ready, which I love. The other nice thing too, is that it goes with, um, with my, my little, um, page flipper as well. And so when I'm, playing a set, you know, if I'm, I'm accompanying somebody and we have a lot of different songs or whatever, then I can change pages with this just with my foot, which is awesome. So, um, let's see. Back to that one. Okay. Um, IMSLP is also great. Um, MuseScore, I've actually gotten quite a few um, pieces of music off of MuseScore uh, for free. Um, for And it's it's all the popular stuff that my, my students love. So if I have a student that says, oh, I really want to play Birthday by some... I, don't, I can't remember. Some kid asked me to play this uh, this rap song, <laughs> really. And I found it on MuseScore. And we started talking about analyzing chords and, and things like that. So, you know, I don't, I, clearly you're not probably going to use most of this for performance um, kinds of situations, but it's a great one to use um, in, you know, being able to teach some of the songs that the kids really want to learn. Tito Music is another one. Scribd is a subscription, and it also has, um, uh, you know, audio books and, and print books and things as well. And then YouTube. And I was just going to show you, this is um, one of my kids doing uh, Piano Maestro. And a couple of years ago, I did a um, a uh, recital where they just used uh, technology, and we put we put the technology up on the TV screen while they played along with it, and that was a really fun um, recital that we had. Um, all right, so that's that one. Okay, so theory and ear training. Um, let's see. 
Okay, so of course there's my RCM, RCM, uh, RCA Music. I'm really disappointed that they're, they, it's becoming a subscription now. Um, and so I found some other um, outlet, you know, ways to do this because not all my kids want to pay an extra $6 a month to be able to access this. Um, and so I use Tenuto and I really love, I love this app. Um, it it um, helps to teach a lot of um, the uh, the theory and the ear training that they're going to need to know. You just have to do a little bit more work than just going on RC Music because you need to know exactly what they're supposed to be studying. Um, and I'll show you a little video in a second. Well, I guess I can do it right now because I'll do something else in a minute. Until you get to A. So this is a Zoom class that I did um, with one of my students F and we were working on C C signatures. G D that's it. Got to get to A. An A. And A. Okay, F, C, G, D, A. Those are the sharps that see a D major. Okay, D major. Oh. Oh, F, C. Okay, so so you can see how you can use utilize this in like a Zoom class meeting or something like that to um, test them, and then you just put the answers in as they go along. Um, all right, there's also Sprout Beat. I've used that before. That's also a subscription. Um, this is mostly for beginners, though. That's what I found. And so I didn't actually end up renewing my subscription just because um, it, you can get a lot of worksheets for, for free, too. So, um, but, you know, it's fun to be able to interact a little bit with it. Ear Master, I've used a little bit. Um, Quizlet is a great one. There's already, um, a, there's a, a lot of Quizlets that are already made. Um, the one that I did um, just a couple weeks ago, I had a group lesson. We did it on Zoom, and I made a Kahoot for for my students, and it was super fun. So I'm gonna show I'm gonna show you Kahoot, the Kahoot that I made for my students. Let's see. Wait, not that one. There it is. Okay, so um, you know, so basically, this is just kind of a Let's see, I gotta move you guys. Okay, so I just, I, you know, I, I made all these different answers and then they had to answer them. Can you see that okay? Okay. Um, and, you know, and this is basically taken from the Utah AIM um, uh, theory stuff. So, and, and you're able to, and I just made it myself. I made it private so not everybody can see it, but, um, but my students, but they had a great time doing this um, before. Let me go back. Okay, um, and then okay, and then using Zoom is a great way. And I was just going to show you a piece of um, the group lesson that I did a couple weeks ago. And we were working on air training on intervals. All right, Erin. Second. Second. Good job. I said that, Erin. You guys all hear the second? Here we go. Here comes another one. Um, uh, Spencer. Yes, you got it. Good job. He can see the piano. <laughs> so we had a really good time with that. And I had um, three different classes that I did with, with each of my students at different levels and everything. And, and then we played the Kahoot after we had done some ear training and, and um, kind of reviewed some symbols and and things like that. Um, let's see. Okay, so improvisation and, and composition. So GarageBand is motivating. It's it's not a great like composition software, but it's it's fun for the kids and they can work on beats. Um, I wanted to show you Music Clock really quickly. Um, this one um, I like for improv doing improv. Um, let's see. Okay, and so this this one basically um, it has a backing beat. You can choose whatever key signature you want. So this is the key of C, and this is the natural minor scale. And then it's just got a little backing track that you can play with, and so kids can play around with that. You can choose different songs. So that's Berlin Bar. Here's Detroit Daydream. So 
and I, you know, when my, when my youngest was about six, he sat down with this and he, I, and he just started playing the blues scale. There's a bunch of ones with blues and he learned the blues scale and he was improving. Like I was really impressed. I didn't know he could do that. So that was kind of, that was kind of cool. Um, you know, that he was able to do that. Okay. Um, and then uh, super metronome group box, it's another one that's, it's a metronome that has um, a lot of different beats on it that are great. Cordify and iReal Pro, they basically just have the chords for like thousands of different songs that you can just see the chord progression. So you can work with kids on learning their chord progressions that way. Um, and then there's always Finale and Sibelius. And actually my, um, my youngest son, his teacher, um, is Shane Bowles, and he was working with him on Sibelius this morning uh, when in, during his lesson, uh, on a Zoom lesson, um, writing, having my son write in, um, you know, certain parts of, uh, of, of a score, which was cool. Note Flight I've used before for comp composing. Music Unveiled is Shane Bowles, and he's got a lot of backing tracks that I use. Um, just, I know I'm getting close to being done. Um, so I just want to show you the amazing slow downer app um, that I used on mu with music unveiled for this student right here. So um, she can't, she, you know, just can't play that fast. And so I slowed down um, the, the recording so she could play with the recording. Um, and I've actually done this with a concerto I had to learn. I played it along with Emmanuel X by being able to slow it down enough so that I could play it. And that's how I practice, which I love that app. That's one of my favorite, I would have to say. Okay. Um, all right. So just really quickly, studio organization. A lot of you probably know my music staff. That's how I keep track of all of my um, billing and invoicing and everything and it is fabulous it just does auto everything I don't ever have to talk to any parents about paying me I always get paid on time it's it's awesome you can also set it up so that um, it takes automatic um, you know withdrawals from accounts and things like that which is great better practice app I totally recommend to um, I went to Tanara for a little while this is for students to be able to keep track of their um, their lesson plans and things like that and um, I, I, Tanara I tried for a couple of months but I just love better practice app it's really easy to put student um, information in um, Okay, I know I'm out of time, Heather. I'm just, I'm really, I'll hurry, I promise. Okay, I just want to show really quickly this Better Practice app. Um, okay, so the nice thing about this, here it comes, um, is, okay, when I go to my homepage, I can, I set up these, you know, to let them know when the next concerts are. Um, I can see my practice schedule, and I can see who's practice. Um, and then on my students here, I've got all of my students and all of their assignments are on here. Um, and so, and I can see this, her, her week just started yesterday or today. Um, but then I can, you know, put different things in here. So, um, for instance, I've got this YouTube video here that I can, I can, um, have her listen to during the week, which is really nice. In the I muscle builder exercise. I can also make my own videos, which I've done quite often um, to help kids remember how, like, well, let's see, her chromatic chord. She, she was asking me a question about them, so I just showed her how, what I meant when I said chromatic chords. And I did that right during the middle of the week. Oh, now I need to stop it. There we go. All right. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much, that's, that's what I've got. And um, I know we don't have a lot of time, but does anybody have any questions? And uh, for everyone, I put in Becky's, her handout in the chat. I don't know if you can see it. If you can, can you give me like a thumbs up so that I know? Yay, it's in there. Okay. I also posted it on our private Facebook group. So if you, if you uh, need it there too, that's where it's at. Thank you so much, Becky. This is amazing. So yes, if, um, for those of you who, who aren't able to see that handout, it is going to, it is on our Facebook page. So or Facebook group. Thank you, Becky. That was awesome. I learned so much from all of your amazing things. And I am definitely going to look at a lot of those, a lot of those tools. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. I think I'm up <laughs> and I have to, I'm happy to say that I was able to uh, let Adam back into the room. So we will have two performances after my, pr my presentation. So 
Uh, thank you, Adam, for your understanding of me accidentally uh, logging you out. <laughs> so my presentation is all about performance anxiety. And I thought I'd share a little, a little story on why I'm sharing this and, and where, why I have a little bit of experience with this myself. Um, I started at the University of Utah working on a piano performance degree as an adult. And I hadn't seriously touched the piano since I was a teenager. And I had forgotten. I forgot that as a teenager, I had a lot of anxiety performing. So thinking that I was going to get this piano performance degree, I was, I was fighting my biggest demon, and that is feeling anxious about performing. Um, the very first class I was in at the University of Utah, it was in a career development course. And the topic for that day was performance anxiety. At the end of the class, um, a lot of the students, all of these young kids, uh, were talking about this, this underground drug of the symphony called propranolol. Have any of you heard of that before? Um, if, if you have, I'm just curious if you have, write yes in the chat so that I, I know if, who's aware of it. But what a propranolol is, is actually a, a beta blocker, which inhibits adrenaline and it, um, it lowers your blood pressure. And I thought, okay, there's my answer. Drugs are, my, drugs are the answer. I know what I need to use to get through this program. And so I started taking uh, one uh, beta blocker every time I went to go to a piano lesson, anytime I would play in like at a performance class. And, um, and then I had a big performance coming up. And that was, it. for me, it was a big performance. It was an end of semester recital where all of the students that my teacher was teaching were all playing together in a, in a recital. And I thought, okay, if one beta blocker is going to help me with my anxiety for little things like my piano lesson, then three are definitely going to help me to get through this recital. And so I took three beta blockers. Um, unfortunately, I didn't know the phys uh, physical effects that that would do to me. I thought it would just help not have shakes. It would help my brain not to be super stressed out. Um, I, already, I already deal with low pressure, a low blood pressure already. And so when I was in the back of the, the hall before it was my time to perform, I could hardly stand up. And so when I was walking onto that stage and I sat down, I could not get my hand, I could barely get my hands up onto the keys. And suffice it to say, that was the worst performance I had ever done in my life. And I left, I left my, that performance and I would not walk back into the hall. So I left, um, for those of you that are familiar with the University of Utah campus, I walked around the whole, the whole campus. It took a long time and I did I went on a, a big soul searching trek to, cite, to decide, was this really what I wanted to do with the rest of my life? Was it really worth it? Because I had just given up a, a wonderful uh, career as a, a tax manager, making plenty of money to become a student and to deal with this stress. So I decided I was going to give myself one more semester. I was going to do one semester, everything that I possibly could do to learn how to deal with my my performance anxiety. And, um, and if it didn't work out, then I would go back to doing taxes and everything would be fine and knowing that I didn't totally give up. So I did some research and um, uh, I met, I found this person named Dr. Keith Henshin. Are any of, have any of you heard of him? If you have right in the chat, just so that I know, I hadn't heard of him before, but Keith Henshin was the sports psychologist for the Utah Jazz. Um, he's retired now, but when I was in school, that's what he was doing. He was also the sports psychologist for the University of Utah's women gymnastic team, and they were always undefeated just at the top of their game. He was also the sports psychologist for the, U, uh, the US Olympic ski team. And so I uh, sheepishly emailed him and I said, would you consider, I know you work with these amazing athletes, but would you consider working with a, a, a music student? And he graciously said yes. So I worked with him every, every other week. I went into his office for private uh, instruction for an hour 
And the things that I'm going to share with you today are the things that he shared with me. Um, and I just realized I did not set up at my time. So <laughs> I, I, I probably spoke for about five minutes just right there. So I'm just going to briefly go through this presentation um, of some of the, the things that he taught me. So let me pull up my, my presentation slide. Start from the beginning. Okay, here we go. So he was, he, um, for those of you that aren't from Utah, uh, those of you that are, you probably are familiar, you know who this is. This is Carl Malone. And Carl Malone was one of the, the uh, NBA players on the Utah Jazz back in the late 90s, 80s and 90s. He, um, whenever he would have a, three throw, a free throw, he would always uh, say something, whisper something to himself. And Dr. Henshin told me what that was. I don't remember what it was, but it was just to get himself into his mindset on before he would throw the ball to get him into the right uh, frame of, of mind. Because uh, Dr. Henshin said that 95% of our perf uh, performance has to do with uh, practicing. It's in the practice room. But the 5%, which is the mindset, is what controls the 95%. So, and that made a lot of sense to me because no matter how much I practiced, my mind got in the way. I, would, I could practice for hours and hours, but my mind would get in the way when it really came down to the, the point of having to perform. So these are the five things that, we, that he covered with me. He talked about relaxation, concentration, imagery, self-talk, and developing a mental routine. Okay, so under relaxation, um, each, every other week we would go, he would, I would come in and we would go through different relaxation techniques. So these are some of the things that we talked about. I'm just going to review just, to, uh, just maybe one or two of, of each area. And um, if you have any questions on any of the others, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to share, but I'll share in this area, in the relaxation, there's actually three that I wanted to share. And the first is progressive relaxation. Time and time again, when I would be in school, and my husband would say this too, and it would drive me crazy. He would say, just relax and have fun. That would drive me crazy when people would say that because it's like, for one, it's like they're speaking a different language. I didn't know what relax, for one, and having fun, <laughs> seriously. Um, but uh, what Dr. Henshin taught me was how to teach your body how what it means to relax. And so... Um, these are some of the things that I do with my own students. So before COVID, we always had performance group classes. And at the beginning of each group class, I would spend about five minutes going over each one of these exercises. So we would take like one a month. And this is, these are some of the things that you could do with your own students to help them with their, uh, with their, their own uh, anxieties about performing. So the first one, progressive relaxation, is if you tighten up a body part. And so you would go through like, all of your body parts, tighten up a body part and hold that tension for about five seconds and then release it and feel if you wanted to even try that with your hands, you could try that, tighten up your hands really tight, hold that for five seconds and then release it. You'll find that your hands are relaxed and going through all of your body parts, your shoulders, your torso, your hips, your legs, your feet, your head, um, it will help to learn how to relax. The measured breath exercise is one that you might have you might have heard of before, and that's where you breathe in for four, hold it for four, breathe out for seven. Um, because our brains need uh, need oxygen, if we are breathing very shallow, our brains aren't going to be able to get the oxygen that it needs. And so it will just help to relax you a little bit more by getting more, inner, uh, more, inner, uh, more oxygen into your body. The autogenic training is my favorite. And so this is the one when Dr. Henshin taught me this one, first of all, I thought it was super weird, but <laughs> cause I went into his, into his office and he had a small room and he said, okay, I want you to lay down on the ground and close your eyes. And for this is like at a time I didn't know him that well. I trust, I totally trust him now, but at the point I wasn't like, well, who is this guy? Um, but what he taught, and this is what I've done with all of my students, it is a group and they've loved it, is that you um, say to yourself while breathing in right hand 
and while you're breathing out comfortably warm seven times. And so while you're saying that you're going to try and get your hand to warm up. Then you do the same thing with the left hand, right uh, left hand comfortably warm seven times, then your right foot and then your left foot. And this will definitely help you to just relax a little bit. What, um, what I found is after doing this for about three weeks, I was able to actually get my hand warmer. So it was pretty cool. And the fact that my brain could control, could control um, and regulate the temperature in my body on a specific part of my body. So that was pretty neat knowing that um, our brains are so powerful that it can, can control the temperature. Um, so maybe try that, try that for three weeks. I do that also like at nighttime, if I can't sleep, I'll go through, I'll start doing the right hand, left hand, uh, left, right foot, and by, I can't even get to the left foot before I, I'm already asleep. Um, neurofeedback is another one. You can look that one up. That one's a, a, a popular one. Um, concentration. Last month, we had a great presentation by Wendy Bachman, and she talked about deep memorization. So her, her, whole, sli uh, her whole handout is on our Facebook group. So uh, if you want that, it's, that's where it is. If you're not on Facebook, let me know and I can share that with you. With you. Um, the three, two, one exercises. Oops, let me go back to that. Um, this one is a good one as far as concentration goes. It takes 11 minutes to go through. And so what that is, is you're teaching um, your mind what to focus on. So for five minutes, if you take like a small object and I, I have a, a ping pong ball, my, my son was playing ping pong ping pong the other day and it was in my room. So I thought, okay, I'm going to use this to share, <laughs> hold it in your hand for five minutes and just analyze it. It's something, just something small and really focus on that from the color to the shape, to the, the, the temperature of it, anything about a small object for five minutes. The, uh, for three minutes, then it's called the broad external where you are going to focus on everything outside of you. So you could be focusing on everything outside of your body for, for three minutes. Two minutes is called the broad internal where you close your eyes and you focus on everything inside of your body from your heart rate to your breath, if anything hurts, if you're cold, um, anything inside of you. And the number one, uh, narrow internal, this is the hardest one. Um, and I've never been able to accomplish this and I don't know who could, but it's trying to stay inside of yourself and think of nothing. So just with how it like a totally blank slate, not thinking of not letting any thoughts, um, get into your mind. So that's, that's pretty tricky. Um, the shifting focus concentration exercise. This one is one that my students really like, and I'll, you'll understand why in just a second. It takes three weeks to get through, 10 minutes a night. And so for the first week, I have students read a book for 10 minutes, and then they're supposed to tell their parents what they read. The second week, they turn on, the mu turn on their music and read a book, and uh, tell after 10 minutes, tell their parents what they read. The third week, they turn on the TV, they turn on the music, they read their book. And um, after 10 minutes, then they have to tell their parents what they read. And the purpose of this is to help condition a student learn how to eliminate the outside noises when um, they're performing, just to be able to focus on the task at hand. So that's a pretty fun one. Okay, imagery is all about, and I think I'm just going to just go over this really briefly. It's all about what you're focusing on when you perform. Um, you could imagine uh, a good performance, imagining yourself as the audience watching yourself perform, imagining yourself as, your, as you're yourself performing for an audience, um, going through it, imagining what it feels like on the keys, the temperature in the room, the um, just the whole experience of it. Imagery is a, is a good way to help a student with um, practice outside of, away from the piano. And the fourth one that Dr. Henshin talked about was positive self-talk. Now these topics that I'm sharing with you here are actually 
things that Dr. Henshin did not cover with me. These are um, things that I got from other uh, counselors that helped me with, um, with, some, with some of the anxiety or some of the classes that I took. There's uh, mindfulness-based therapy, um, learning that your mind is like a, a chessboard and your thoughts are like the pieces that are playing on the chessboard and letting them come and letting them go. So um, that could be quite powerful teaching a student if they have some negative thoughts when they're playing, just to just let those thoughts go and think that they're just putting them to bed, just letting them, just letting them go through their mind. Um, the self-talk with trigger points. I met with a counselor in Brigham City in Utah to, where he taught me about trigger points where um, you say per, uh, some affirmations and I came up with 10 different affirmations with when I was in school. One of them was, I am prepared and perform with ease. <laughs> so I would tell that to myself. Every evening I'd go through all 10 of those affirmations while doing trigger points. And so what, if you see in the slide, you see these uh, little dots of the, on the people. So it's basically, you would like tap on each um, of the trigger points. So it would be like the eyebrow. And I would say, I, um, I am prepared and perform with ease. And the same under your eye, under your nose, under your chin, on your hand, right on the collarbone and then under on your rib. And so just going through those, I found was a really good way to uh, have some positive thoughts right before I would go to bed. Um, instead of freaking out about, every, I, have, I always have anxiety. And so thinking about negative things, I ended with something positive and that was very helpful. Um, I met with a wonderful uh, counselor who, who taught a course at the University of Utah named um, Kev, um, Steve Emerson. For any of you are Utahns, if you know who he is, he taught all about EMDR. And so it was the same thing. I took the same concept of using self affirmations and you, you choose two spots that your eyes are going to like scan back and forth, as you see in that picture. And I would say while scanning, I would, I would say each of those affirmations. Um, somehow it's supposed to help your brain from one side to the other side. I don't know, but it, it, it was helpful for me. And lastly is establishing a pre-performance routine. So if you did everything that I just talked about today, that would take about two hours, which is super crazy. You do not want your students spending two hours a day preparing that 5%. They still need to be spending that 95% of their time working on uh, practicing. So I would have them limit what they would, I would tell the students practice doing, to come up with a routine for three or five minutes choose a relaxation, some type of a breath exercise, come up with some imagery, come up with some positive affirmation that will help you. And then just spend that five minutes, three to five minutes prior to a performance, maybe prior to their practicing each day um, to train their brain how to think. Okay. And some additional re uh, references are right here. So feel free to uh, look at these, um, take a snapshot of it if you want. But these are some really great books that are helpful for you. So um, go ahead and uh, if, you, if you want these, I can also post, I can also send these to you later too. But I think that is my whole presentation. So Thank you so much for listening. I know my time is way up and um, I'm going to turn it over to Adam. Adam, if you can introduce yourself and then uh, share what you're going to do, that would be great. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Heather. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Okay. I don't, I don't really ever use my phone with Zoom, um, but I wasn't able to use my computer this morning. So I hope this works. And I hope you guys can hear um, the pieces this morning. Uh, so thank you, Heather, and uh, my name is Adam Haas. I am the uh, music program director at the Colorado Springs Conservatory in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and I've been here for about four years. Um, I've taught some college um, in Arkansas before. I um, did most of my degrees in Colorado, but also did my master's at Indiana as well. So um, I just want to thank you all for um, giving me this time to present a couple of etudes. I'm going to do two etudes from level six. And both of these pieces are in the RCM uh, level six etude book. So if you have that and you want to uh, pull it up and follow along, that'd be great. I think Heather also has the pieces and can share them on the screen as well. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Takatina by Kabalevsky. 
is a piece that I'm sure we all know really well. And I've met some teachers who are sick of it and are tired of teaching it, but I love this piece and it never gets old for me. And pretty much any student that I've given this to, um, they enjoy it as well. So, so I'll start with the Takatina. Um, one of the things that I love about these RCM etude books is that in the table of contents, they um, give a, a brief description about what each etude uh, focuses on in terms of the technical difficulty. Um, so I, I think that can be helpful if you're um, needing to find a piece quickly for a student and maybe you don't want to play through the whole book and maybe you know what the student needs to work on. Maybe they need to work on staccato touch or double third. You can quickly read through those descriptions and then find the pieces that focus on those technical difficulties. So I think that's kind of a neat feature of these books. Um, so the Takatina, I think the technical difficulties in this are pretty straightforward. It's left hand melody and staccato touch in the right hand, specifically with parallel first inversion triads. Um, so on this piece, I, I think it makes sense to kind of break it down um, and separate. And, and one thing I like to do with etudes is I like to take the technical difficulty and apply it to some other exercise or pattern that the student um, should know. So for example, on this one, I might start the student off by playing just some parallel um, first inversion triads in C major, starting with a C um, first inversion triad, and just go up maybe an octave or two. So this really gets the student um, used to playing these, these chords. They get used to the shape of a first inversion triad. Um, it allows us to kind of work on using a nice, loose, flexible wrist and getting that staccato touch. So once they get comfortable with that, then I might have them in the left hand add just the C major scale legato. So it could be something like this. And we could even expand it beyond that. Sometimes when you're playing parallel chords, it's nice to break it down into two notes of the chord. So they could play just the bottom two notes. They could play the outer two notes or just the top two notes. So different ways to just get the hand used to that shape and getting finger security on the notes of those chords. Um, I also like to have them play just the pinky note because that tends to be where um, some of the insecurity with the notes um, and the finger placement um, tends to happen. And it's, but it's also where we want to voice um, in the right hand. So they might play the left hand with the scale and then just pinky in the right hand. So I like to have students do this for maybe like the first month while they're learning this piece. Um, it just, it really complements and supports what they're gonna be working on in the piece. So then when we get into the piece, um, if I have a student who is maybe a slower learner and they, you know, like they like to take their time working through everything, I might have them start with the right hand uh, measure 19 through 34. That's the trickiest part. It's where you get all the black notes and, and all the accidentals. Um, if a student learns quickly, you might not need to do that. But if you're looking at just that section, um, sometimes it helps to analyze the chords. But in the first several measures, I've had some success with um, just thinking in terms of black note chords and white note chords. And so they don't get too bogged down by thinking, you know, G flat, B flat, and E flat, and all these accidentals, but they just think black to white or white to black. Um, then when they get to measure 25, um, there's a pattern and a sequence here. So I think it helps to kind of point that out to them where you have C major chord that moves up by half step. And you do that twice. And then you go down a half step and do the exact same pattern. So B major to C major. And so if they can see that pattern in the sequence, um, it can help learn that section. So once they're kind of comfortable with the right hand, um, then we can start working on the left hand. I've had a lot of students who, when they first start playing this melody, they play it as if there's a slur connecting the whole thing. And it kind of sounds like this. Um, 
And to me, that that you know that doesn't capture the um, the character of this piece. It's a Russian, yes, it's a Russian dramatic fiery piece, and it's it's built on these smaller uh, melodic ideas where uh, the articulations and the slur markings are really um, central to the character of the melody. So when they're focusing on this melody right from, from the very beginning, I think it's important that we highlight the character of it and really follow the slur markings so that if notes are not slurred, they're a little bit more um, separated and um, a little more articulated. So it could sound something like this. So to me, that that's kind of the difficulty with the left hand. If, if you're thinking of just a big slur, it's an easy melody and um, it's, it's not really that tricky to play, but it loses all the character and the, the Russian flair that this piece needs to have. Um, so then uh, once you start putting hands together, there are several, um, several ways that, that I like to approach this. One is to start by having them play just the pinky note in the right hand, because this will um, hopefully highlight the fact that the right hand basically imitates the melody. And so on. So once they kind of realize that the melody is actually in octaves, uh, that can kind of help them as far as listening and, and finding that melody hidden in there in the right hand. Uh, let's see, other, other things that um, I, I like to do with um, hands together. Um, one is to, to work on balance. And so, so what I might have a student do is exaggerate the balance. So play the left hand really heavy and forte and the right hand light and piano. Um, um, another thing they can do is play the left hand, um, pressing down the keys and then ghost play the right hand. Um, they could also play the right hand on their lap while the left hand is on the keys. So all these uh, different things to um, help kind of uh, work on the balance issue because um, as we know, with students, when they're playing left-hand melody, it's hard to get them to bring that out. So that's one of the tricky things in this piece. Um, and then lastly, before I just kind of play through the whole piece for you, there are just a couple of um, expressive markings in here that, that I think are important for the student to, um, to work on. And one is in measure uh, 34, this is on page two, it's really important that they know that on beat two of this measure, the melody is coming back, kind of like it is at the beginning. So this is the A section returning, and that E that's slurred to the downbeat of 35 needs to be separate from the stuff that comes before it. And you know, you hear so many students when they're playing this section, like the melody starts on, on measure 35, as opposed to that pickup into 35. So it's really important that we have that separation right there. So um, I, I like to highlight that and make sure that they're really aware of where that melody starts. Um, the motive in measure six, and this motive is throughout the whole piece where you have the dotted quarter to an eighth note. Um, I like to have students play the eighth note very light and the dotted quarter um, full and heavy so that it has more of this kind of articulation. And that should help reinforce this idea of, of smaller uh, motives as opposed to everything being connected with a long slur. So I'll go ahead and play this piece for you. Um, I know we all know this one really well, um, but you know, with all these things in mind, I, I think it, can really help bring out the, the really special character in this piece and, and, and make it very exciting and very dramatic and fiery. Thank you. 
pretty much it on this piece. Um, again, it's one of my favorite pieces and students tend to love it. Um, it's just, it, to me, it never gets old. It has so much character and um, it, it can be a very exciting piece, but also really is a great teaching piece for some of these technical difficulties um, that we just talked about. So the next piece that I'm going to talk about is the River City Blues. Uh, this piece is by Martha Meyer, and it's on page 14 in the book. Um, the technical difficulties on this piece, um, if you look in the beginning of the book, it says uh, swing rhythm and stride bass. So that's that's what we're working on this piece. I'll go ahead and play it first and then um, talk through uh, some of the cool elements of this piece. charming piece um you know just another you know wonderful teaching piece by martha meyer she has so many um amazing pieces out there um so with this one you know teaching swing rhythm can be tricky because it's not written on the page it's it's you know sort of an improvisatory element that that is a, a feel thing and you know, some students feel it really naturally and others struggle with it. So one thing I like to do is have students just listen to a lot of swing music, just to start to feel that rhythm. Um, another thing I like to do is have them clap a straight eighth note rhythm, and then I'll tell them to now turn it into swing and we kind of go back and forth. So it could be something like this, where they do straight, two and three and four, and then swung. and they just go back and forth. And you can do that for you know, 30 seconds and it, it really helps to kind of show the difference mm -hmm. between a straight rhythm and a swung rhythm. Um, another thing that we can do as far as applying swing rhythm to maybe an exercise they already know, we can kind of go back to the whole scale idea and play just a C major scale on um, straight. then we can try a swap. So another way to just take some of these um, technical difficulties in the piece and apply it to something that they already know. Hopefully a student in this level is playing some scales and they can do that fairly easily. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of a good way to get, get students into the swing rhythm. Um, another thing I might do with this piece is just have them clap just the right hand rhythm. And sometimes it helps to write in where the beats are, especially if you have syncopations. Um, you know, encourage them to think of triplet subdivisions. That helps to know where to put that, you know, that, that, that third note of the triplet beat and, and where it needs to line up. 
So it's really important to get a good feel and, and establish what this swing rhythm needs to feel like and sound like at the very beginning. Okay, the stride bass, um, those of you that play jazz uh, know that a stride bass is, it's a two beat pattern in the left hand where you play a root note, and then on the second beat you play a chord. So if you look in measures one and two, this is the, the stride bass. So th these can be a little bit tricky because obviously there's a lot of shifting and, you know, if you're dealing with something bluesy or jazzy, you might have some kind of tricky chords with some accidentals, things like that. So, um, but that's where the stride bass is. And that happens kind of throughout the piece. It's not constant. Um, as you can see, if you're just looking through, there are several measures where there is no stride bass, um, but that's kind of one of the technical difficulties of this piece. Um, I like to have students analyze this piece. It's it's a jazzy, bluesy piece, so it's a good chance to introduce this idea of extended harmonies and blues notes, and you know, helping them kind of understand how to write in pop chord notation, things like that. So um, I like to do that on this piece. It's a good idea to analyze the form. This one's just the basic ABA, uh, but that helps them figure out you know where themes you know come back from you know, in the, in the return of the A section and how the B section is different, things like that. Um, yeah, so once they start practicing this piece, um, if we're working on the left hand and we're doing any of these stride uh, bass patterns, um, I, I think it's important that they do their shifts nice and quick so they're not getting to the chord in the last second and then, you know, struggling to find the notes but instead moving quickly. Just like they would do on any kind of um, big leap in any kind of, in any hand. Um, I also like to highlight that there are really only maybe four or five different um, chords that we do the stride bass on. You have your G chord or maybe a G7. You do it on a C6 chord, you do it on a C sharp fully diminished seven, and then later on, I think you do it on an A minor chord, um, also E7. So if I can have the student just kind of play through those chords over and over in the stride bass pattern, and that covers all the different chords in the piece that you would do the stride bass pattern on. So um, I think that helps simplify things. It's not that complicated. Um, they're not going to be doing this throughout the whole piece on a bunch of different chords. There's really only about five chords that they have to do it on. And it's the same inversion every time. Um, let's see. Once the students start getting their hands together, there are a lot of stylistic things that we can talk about. When I first um, looked through this piece, what caught my attention was that there aren't very many expressive markings. I mean, there's a few dynamics, but it really only ranges from mezzo piano to mezzo forte. So not a lot to work with there. Um, a few crescendos, decrescendos, um, really hardly any articulation. It's pedaled kind of throughout, a lot of slur markings. So I think it's important to find the spots where there is something interesting. And, and one of those would be in measure four, um, there's a rest on the and of one in both hands. And this is the only spot in the whole piece where both hands are resting. So I think it's really important to make a really clear break right there, you know, silence for half a beat, even play the downbeat staccato so that we have that separation. Um, another, I guess, kind of interesting uh, measure would be measure 12 at the bottom of the first page. Uh, we have a staccato and it's the only staccato in the whole piece. So I think it's really important that it's really short so that, that we can hear that, that this is something different than what's going on in the rest of the piece. Uh, measure 20, uh, we have mezzo piano for three beats. And this is only interesting because right before it, we have mezzo forte and right after it, mezzo forte again. So um, I think it's important to bring that out. Um, but other than that, you know, there's not a whole lot. So I, I think this is a piece where you could let the student have a little bit of liberty with some of these dynamics. Um, if you want to play some of the mezzo fortes more like forte, 
get maybe even softer on some of the mezzo pianos like the one in measure 20, I think that can be really effective. Um, also, you know, a common feature with jazz and bluesy music is syncopation. And there's a lot of that in this piece. So maybe figuring out ways to accent or emphasize some of those, maybe not through the whole piece, but, but picking some, some special ones that, that you want to bring out and emphasize a little bit is also very, um, I think, appropriate for this style. And then I also like to let students experiment on, on blues and jazzy pieces, maybe kind of do it completely different than what's written on the page. So for this one, I might say, let's try it fast. And we're gonna play um, the left hand, like the chord part of the stride bass. We're gonna play it short and we're gonna do a lot less pedal. So it could sound like this. changes the character of it. It's not so lazy and laid back feeling, but um, you know, it kind of introduces this idea of, of you know, experimentation and getting creative with a piece, especially in a bluesy, jazzy style where, you know, jazz players are always kind of doing their own thing with the piece and, and putting their own spin on it. So I like to do that with these kinds of pieces. Also, you'll see a lot of the stride bass in faster tempos. And so I, th I think it helps to be able to try playing it in that more kind of bouncy, um, light, light touch like that. So um, I think that's pretty much it on this piece. Um, it's a really charming piece and you know a great teaching piece for introducing swing and blues and um, I've taught it to two students, I think, and they both loved it, and they're still playing it, even though they played it two years ago. Um, it's, it's still one of their favorites, so I hope you enjoyed that piece, and I think that's all I've got. Thank you so much, Adam. This was so insightful. I actually have learned so much from all of the things that you've pointed out today. I don't know. I know you're on your phone, so I don't know if you can see uh, what people have written in the chat, but... Um, Paul Schmaltz said, in my experience from hearing this from exam students is counting the rest steadily at the end. I'm not sure.